The vast majority of days in human history are relatively inconsequential. That is to say, if they had gone differently, it would have had very little impact on the course of the events that followed. Even something as important as a presidential election is, in the grand scheme of things, relatively inconsequential. There are very few moments in human history that carry some very real and significant consequences for the future. But the miracle of Dunkirk is one of those moments in history that we can look back at point at and say, if things had gone differently, if some facts had just been just a little bit different, the world today would be unrecognizable from what we know. But we can never know just how significantly the actions at Dunkirk affected the outcome of World War II, there are a few things we can say for certain. 338,200 and 26. That is the number of men pulled from the beaches of Dunkirk over the course of the eight-day evacuation. That is 293,226 more lives saved than the initial estimate suggested was possible. In one of the most stunning displays of bravery in history, the civilian public not only assisted in the war effort from home, but brought themselves from the safety of an unoccupied nation to the front lines, an action that very likely changed the outcome of the war. Today on Mega Projects, we're going to talk about the Herculean effort that it took to pull off one of the most miraculous rescue missions in all of human history. On the morning of the 1st of September 1939, the silence hanging over the Polish countryside was broken by the low hum of German bombers making their way to the nearest Polish cities. With the climate at the time, many of those who stood outside to watch must have known that this could mean only one thing – war. Though many of them had lived through a war prior to this, none of them could have the slightest idea just how dark the path ahead was. As you will undoubtedly have heard before, the efficiency of the German war machine was unrivaled by any other army in the world. The Blitzkrieg thundered through Europe, crushing all that stood against it in a matter of weeks. At the invasion of Poland, Britain and France declared war upon Germany, creating the British Expeditionary Forces and the Grand Courtier General, the general headquarters for the French military. Together, these two forces assembled along the northern French borders. The plan was for the French forces to man the France-Germany border and the British Expeditionary Force to man the France-Belgium border. After the end of World War I, it was decided that were history to repeat itself and Germany were to invade again, France would be better prepared to defend itself, hence the construction of a supposedly impenetrable barrier between France and Germany called the Maginot Line, which we've actually done a video on already if you'd like to check it out. And what did the Germans do when they faced this state-of-the-art fortress? Well, they simply went around it. Now, in fairness to the Maginot Line, it did its job. The Germans recognized that it wouldn't be possible to force their way through the line without taking unacceptable casualties. There is also a running joke that the French didn't consider what to do if their enemy simply went around, but in reality, this was accounted for. It was the job of the British Expeditionary Force and French forces to hold the northern part of the line. This was the border between France and Belgium. Upon their arrival at their post along the Belgium-France border in September of 1939, they began frantically reinforcing the Maginot Line's defenses in preparation for the German invasion. Then, on the 10th of May, the Germans launched their attack. The Allied forces' plan was that once the Germans had crossed into Belgium, they would lead an advance upon Dao River, and if properly enacted, it, this would halt or at least slow down a German attack. However, the Allies had not counted on the speed with which the Germans were able to mount an invasion. Such was the ferocity of the German advance that the Allied forces effectively made but a few steps into Belgium before having to beat a hasty retreat back to the French border. And only two days after the initial invasion, the German forces had for the first time since World War I crossed onto French soil once more. After this, it was simply a matter of retreating as fast as the Germans could advance. Over the following days, the Germans would push British, French, and Belgian forces all the way back to the coast. Finally, 11 days after the German invasion had begun on the 21st of May, a telegram was sent to the German High Command from the general in charge of the German Western Front, Erwin Rommel. This telegram contained only four words, and they read, I'm on the coast. What this meant was the German panzer divisions had successfully flanked the Allied forces, cutting them off from the rest of France in a pincer movement. 
Surrounded on all sides with their back to the British Channel, the British and French forces set up a ferocious defense at the port of Dunkirk. Further north along the coast, the Belgian forces had set up their own defense. However, this was crumbling fast. British commanders knew that once the Belgian defenses fell, the German forces would be able to advance from the north, and if this were to happen, they would overwhelm the British and the French garrisons at Dunkirk. By the 25th of May, the Allied forces were well and truly hemmed in. It must have been a truly bewildering feeling to have been truly confident and even unperturbed by the impending invasion to being completely surrounded in a matter of only 15 days. They must have been feeling that same numb shock that each nation that had stood against the Nazi blitzkrieg had felt. Watching their forces and defenses get brushed aside as if they weren't even there. On this day, Winston Churchill made a speech to the British House of Commons calling the efforts to repel the German attacks a colossal military disaster. Clearly, something had to be done, and it was now that the British began to send all available Royal Navy ships to the port of Dunkirk to begin the evacuation. Just after 7 p.m. on the 26th of May, Winston Churchill ordered the beginning of the immediate evacuation of Dunkirk, calling it Operation Dynamo. As we already know, nearly 28,000 men had already been evacuated the day before. Some had simply taken ships left at the port, as a couple of British Navy vessels had been near enough to begin ferrying soldiers to Dover already. But for the most part, there was a catastrophic buildup of soldiers waiting on the beaches. Now, at this point, let's depart from our bird's eye tactical view of the Axis Allied front lines, and let's zoom in. We'll find ourselves behind the eyes of an individual soldier standing on the beaches awaiting transport home. You've just been retreating for the last 15 days in little more than complete chaos and pandemonium is the order of the day. All around you, commanders are calling for order while you try and find the other soldiers in your section, but it's barely possible to stay within your own regiment. A cacophony of French and English shouts to order are vying to be heard, but neither is audible over the other. And surrounding it all is the fear that every second you spend standing on the beach allows these seemingly unstoppable German forces to push their way nearer and nearer. It was a pretty stark image, and it was only going to get worse. The public was not made aware of it, and the highest estimates for soldiers to be saved were 45,000. Now, we couldn't find a specific number for how many soldiers were actually on the beaches, likely due to the chaos, but it's thought to have been as many as 400,000 men. In the UK, the Archbishop of Canterbury was leading the nation in prayers for the soldiers. And on the first day, only 7,669 soldiers were pulled from the beaches. The next day, one cruiser, eight destroyers, and 26 other craft were called into service. However, with the docks completely destroyed, the Allies were forced to use two long breakwaters called moles as they were the only structures capable of docking the larger ships. This drastically slowed the boarding process and made it nearly impossible for the larger ships to be filled to capacity. Smaller ships were used to ferry soldiers from the beaches to the larger ships waiting to dock at the moles. However, this again was very time-consuming and inefficient, allowing only 15,000 men to escape on the second day. On the other side of the channel, there was a feeling of despair, not only for the fear of the proximity of the enemy, but the fear that many families were about to lose their children. The following day, the 28th of May, there was further bad news. The Belgian defense further north along the coastline had broken and the Belgian military had surrendered. This allowed the German panzer divisions to begin pushing forward towards the French rearguard who were guarding against a German advance from the north. Now, look, at this point in the video, you'd be forgiven for getting a little exasperated. Seemingly, nothing was going to plan. Certainly, the individuals on the beaches weren't too happy about the proceedings. And neither were the families and friends of these soldiers separated by just 40 miles of water. The feeling must have been like watching someone drown while being just out of reach of a life preserver. Fortunately, the tide was about to turn. For the last three days, the Luftwaffe had been attacking the last remaining pockets of Allied resistance at other ports up and down the coast. However, once the evacuation had begun in earnest, they began to focus their bombing and strafing runs on the docks, the beaches, the approaching boats, and the town of Dunkirk itself. In response, 16 RAF squadrons were called upon to protect the evacuation fleet traveling to and from Dunkirk. This meant that the RAF was spending much of its time engaging German fighters and bombers over the channel or further inland to prevent them from getting to the docks. This means that despite the massive show of force brought out by the RAF, very little of it was seen by the soldiers on the beaches. This led to the false belief that there was very little support from the RAF through the whole ordeal. However, thanks to poor flying conditions and the losses inflicted by the RAF, only a fraction of the Luftwaffe's aircraft were 
sent to attack the beaches and the evacuation fleet made it through. Meanwhile, on the ground, the 28th of May saw 47,310 soldiers pulled from the beaches and harbors. And it's here that we begin to see the first little ships arriving. The day before, the British Ministry of Shipping had put out a call to marinas, docks, shipyards, in short, anywhere that a boat might be, saying that they were looking for seaworthy vessels with a shallow draft. Up and down the British south coast, ships were requisitioned by the government and sent to Dunkirk. Once the call was put out, the British public, who had been watching the awful events unfold just over the channel, rose to the call. Fishing vessels, ferries, car ferries, lifeboats, pretty much every kind of boat that you can imagine was called into action. By the end of the evacuation, nearly 850 private vessels had assisted. And when they first began to appear on the 29th of May, the number of soldiers evacuated took a huge upswing. By the 30th of May, the final British divisions had made it past the defensive lines that were holding the Germans at bay only seven miles from the coast. Fortunately for the Allied forces, this was marshy land that was not suitable for tank advances. It was also on this day that a small jetty constructed by the Royal Engineers, consisting of abandoned cars and military vehicles, allowed for a much faster docking of the larger requisitioned boats. With the evacuation in full swing, now 53,823 men were evacuated on the 30th and 68,014 were evacuated on the 31st, marking the most people evacuated in a single day. As the beaches began to clear of British soldiers, soldiers of other nationalities, namely French and some Belgians, were beginning to get their turn on the boats. However, by now the Luftwaffe were sending all they could to the evacuation fleet and the RAF was beginning to get overwhelmed. With the increasing attacks, evacuations by daylight had to be halted on the 1st of June. From then on, there would only be evacuations by night, marking a significant drop in the numbers of those evacuated. Between the 2nd and the 4th of June, British and French rear guard began to fall back toward the beaches as they were, by necessity, to be the last to be evacuated. On the 3rd of June, the British rear guard departed, leaving the remaining 115,000 French soldiers to fight off the advancing Germans, 75,000 of which departed with the British on the 3rd. The next day, the Germans were finally able to close the gap, and the remaining 40,000 French soldiers consisting of the 2nd Mechanized and 68th Infantry Divisions surrendered. Thus, arced the end to one of the most ambitious evacuations in history. Over the 25-day period from the German invasion on the 10th of May to the French surrender on the 4th of June, the cost to the Allied forces was truly staggering. In every sense of the word, this should have been a death blow for every nation in Europe. Even the vast success of the evacuation was marred by everything that was lost. So let's have a rundown. To the British Army, the campaign in France lost them 68,000 men, either killed, wounded, or captured. Nearly 2,500 guns were left, as well as 76,000 tons of ammunition, 20,000 motorcycles, and 65,000 military vehicles were left, often used as roadblocks to slow the German advance. 162,000 tons of fuel for said vehicles was left behind, as well as 445 British tanks. Even basic supplies like food, clothing, rucksacks, shoes, tents, everything totaled a whopping 423,000 tons of supplies simply left behind. This was the vast majority of the supplies with which the British Army had planned to wage war with in the first place. It goes on. A total of nine Allied military destroyers were sunk, six British and three French, over the course of the evacuation. Overall, 243 ships were sunk, including many civilian vessels. Although there is no way to say for certain what the number is, many civilian ships partook in the evacuation without informing the Navy. With the exception of a few catastrophic malfunctions, the majority of the ships that sank did so as a result of either Luftwaffe bombing or attacks from German Navy vessels, mostly U-boats. Many of these ships were full of fleeing personnel, some of which were picked up by other boats. However, there was very little documenting of who was on board the boats prior to their arrival in Dover, so it's difficult to count just how many lives were lost in this way. As we said earlier, many have held the perception that the RAF had been mostly absent during the evacuation, only due to the fact that they were not fighting over the beaches directly, but instead inland and out to sea. Of the 16 squadrons sent to combat the Luftwaffe, 145 aircraft were lost to a comparable 155 German aircraft. It's worth mentioning here that there were other pilots and aircraft available to fight. In fact, Churchill was planning on sending more, however the head of RAF command, Lord Dowding, refused. It was this refusal to send further reinforcements that allowed the German Luftwaffe to break through and put an end to the daytime evacuation. So, now you're probably wondering, well, why did he refuse? 
Well, his stated reason was that he refused to weaken the home front by sending precious squadrons to France. Many criticized this decision and said that he was simply unwilling to assist the other forces in their time of need. However, it took only a few months to see just how fortuitous this decision was when, during the Battle of Britain, every single remaining British fighter was called into service. This was a battle that was very nearly lost to the British had they not been able to summon such a large responding force. We can only hope that Dowding managed to get a few I told you so's in there. So now, a quick aside before we wrap up today's video. With literally tens of thousands of men going along one of the piers every day, there was a risk of a crush forming, a significant danger, considering that every single one of them was desperate to get off the beach. The unenviable job of pier master fell to a man called James Campbell Clouston. From the 27th of May to the 1st of June, the job of regulating and organizing the flow of men along the mole fell to Clouston. He was a Canadian naval officer whose ship had been in Dunkirk port for repairs when it was sunk by a German bombing run. After running the pier for five days, and presumably doing a good job considering the number of men leaving during this period, he was given the opportunity to head home. And so, on the 1st of June, he returned to Dover. The next day, he reported to Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey and volunteered to return to Dunkirk to further assist in the evacuation. This request was granted, and he was put on a requisition civilian ship the next day. Unfortunately, his boat was spotted a couple of miles from the French coast and sunk by German Stukas, killing all on board. The story of Dunkirk is filled with tales of selfless servicemen and civilians putting their lives on the line and ultimately paying with their lives. Unfortunately, many will remain untold, but the story of James Campbell Clouston is one that we can remember and hold on to as a stark reminder of all that people gave. As for those that returned, the French and Belgian forces were moved to camps in the south of England where they were reorganized, British forces regrouped and resupplied, and the nation collectively rejoiced while also mourning for all of those lost. On the 4th of June, Winston Churchill gave his most famous speech to the House of Commons, in which he encapsulates the resilience of the British spirit in the face of evil. While at the time, it was a comment on the British spirit, looking back, we can see that echoed in every nation and group that took part in resisting Axis powers. From the shipyards in America to the underground resistance in Poland, the indomitable spirit of all those who fight against evil is something that we should never forget. So I do hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do click that like button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Also, if you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, why not leave it in the comments below? I do look there for ideas. And thank you for watching.